Looking for beyond ordinary investment opportunities? Global X ETFs is here to help with their suite of thematic income, commodity, and digital asset funds. Explore the range at globalxetfs.com.au. And now, on with the show. How are you now? Broadcasting from the VFS studios in Northbridge in Sydney. You're listening to the All New BIP Show, Season 7, Episode 6. Thank you to Global X for everything they've done for us over the last six weeks of providing this show. And a reminder that all of the financial services, wait, financial services information, all the financial information in this podcast is generally nature only. Speak to a professional advisor about your need. That's me. I'm James Wheeler, Investment Manager at VFS Group. You've heard that a thousand times before. This episode is being recorded on the 3rd of the 3rd, 2023 AD. Uh, the time is 10.39 in the AM Australian Eastern Daylight Time. We're going to get straight to it because we're running behind. Uh, we've got a few things that have cropped up in the Australian calendar showing us that maybe things are too good, things are not amazing, good news, bad news, or is bad news, bad news. We've done this conversation before. Senior economist with the ANZ, Adelaide Timberall. Adelaide, how are you now? Good, thank you. How are you? Not so bad. Look, we, we last night, just a bit of an overview, a brief on the US markets that we've seen recently. Uh, bearish sentiment sort of coming back in on, on good news, uh, you know, strong economy, meaning bad things are happening uh, with regards to rates. Everyone knows that that's a, that's a good news, bad news story. We seem to have a little bit of a switch of that last night. Uh, Fed, uh, I don't know which, uh, Bostic, I think it was. Just I, I don't have those notes in front of me. Raphael Bostic is saying that 25 is probably preferred, but they're going to be watching the data. When I read it, it didn't sound like the most dovish talk to be able to provide the reversal in the market mm -hmm. and the upswing that, that we saw in markets overnight, um, just in the, into the last hour. But apparently the market saw something in there that they liked. Maybe I didn't read it um, as deeply as I could have, but unemployment numbers were mm -hmm. underneath. So technically, if you want bad news to be good news, then you need that number to be higher. And they weren't, but still the market rallied. Um, it's possible that we may have seen the March lows. Uh, big call here at the beginning of March. Uh, on average, that's usually what we would see. Uh, but anyway... On to Australian markets. So that's that's my world and that's the way that I'm seeing it. Australian markets are being push-pulled. We've got the US leads that come in a bit bearish over the last few weeks. But we've also had China, which has been just sort of this powerhouse we're seeing again coming to our rescue. Some amazing numbers out of China really helping the Australian story. Now, Adelaide, you're here, which is great, and I'm glad that you've listened to my gibbering about that. Uh, first things first, let's talk about the numbers that dropped yesterday in, what is it, building approvals. Yes, that's right. So we saw residential building approvals drop by 27.6% month on month in January. Now, that sounds like a huge fall, and it is, but this is a very volatile data set. So plus 20, negative 20, it happens all the time. Um, what we did see, though, was that it was actually came to its lowest monthly level of approvals since July 2012. So that's, I think, a much stronger signal of what's going on. And we also know that um, even though there's been ups and downs over the last few months, we actually saw a quarterly decline from Q3 to Q4 2022, and then another decline in January. So despite expectations of really strong migration through the year, despite the already very low housing supply in the rental market, given how much demand there is, we're seeing very low vacancy rates. We're seeing very strong increases in advertised rents of about 11% year on year growth. We're still seeing people don't want to build or people don't want to create those new developments. And I think that has a lot to do with rising interest rates, uh, which makes the cost of funding higher. The fact that construction materials are so expensive, mm. there's no tradies left. You know, they're all working. Uh, and we're also seeing those falling home prices that are going to come um, once those places are built as well. We are. And, and anecdotally speaking, I can absolutely agree with you. Uh, one of the guests that we had on the show, Graham Howland, GVH Constructions, is... is doing some work for me or is, is quoting some work for me and he does amazing work he's one of the best in the in the business that's why i had him on the show uh well that quote is pretty big so and it was <laughs> it's a little bit a little bit bigger than some of the numbers that we talked about before and he's not he's not ripping me off it's legitimately those 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 expenses are up and higher than where they than where they were before i can tell you that the the stats don't lie on this one adelaide uh what so uh, if we play the tape sort of somewhere to the midway, maybe even to the end, 
What do you see as being the ramifications over the next year or two from data that's dropping like this? So when we look at the current uh, housing sector, what we're seeing is a whole collection of issues. We've already got really, really tight rental markets. We've got higher costs of funding for builders. We've got higher costs of construction. We've got scarcity of workers. And then we've got a lack of risk appetite as the economy slows down. So even though there's going to be so much demand for housing, we're not seeing great incentives to supply that extra housing. And there's just so many backlogs as well in the construction sector. The good thing about that is that it means that we won't see construction uh, activity fall very sharply. That's great for continuing, you know, lower unemployment in that sector, things like that. But overall, what we're seeing is that there are some real negative side effects of the interest rate tightening cycle and housing really is one of them. Housing prices falling in and of themselves, not so bad. That helps some people, hurts others. Uh, And we do want to see people get a bit more cautious about their spending, which is kind of the whole reason the Reserve Bank hikes rates in the first place is to make people and businesses think twice about that. But When it comes to the supply side, um, there are some real issues there. Now, you you just mentioned, we've talked about this before, so it'll be good to go into just a continuing theme, confidence and spending um, in the face of interest rate rises and in the face of, uh, I I did say, I said a while ago that that the end of the rate hikes, of this rate hike cycle locally would be when you see Governor Lowe on the front page of the Telegraph with one of those big painted X's uh, superimposed on his face. I think that we're very close to that point now, but uh, do, do you think that um, he sort of has become an enemy of the state, hasn't he? Uh, uh, the, the poor guy's he's just out there doing a job, but the communication hasn't been amazing. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to talk about that. You can, but it might be a bit controversial. But where do you see uh, confidence uh, happening at the moment in the market? Yeah, look, I think the Reserve Bank has had a really hard few years for a lot of reasons, but particularly for just the lack of certainty around how we would come out of COVID. And now we have one of the sharpest rate hiking cycles that we've seen in recent history. Consumer confidence is really damaged. Um, We're seeing consumer confidence uh, among its 10 lowest results since the start of COVID, uh, which is about, you know, 152 Mm. weeks ago. So we're in the bottom 10, even though the unemployment rate is below four, even though there's $300 billion of accumulated household savings that wouldn't have been there without COVID, you know, even though the economy is actually so overheated and that's the reason why we need to increase rates. Now, when we look at uh, what type of people are feeling, you know, more or less confident, it's the, unsurprisingly, uh, the homeowners with debt, they're actually, uh, their average confidence is 11 points below the average for all housing cohorts. So not only is everyone feeling a little bit shaky, you know, on, on the economy, on their own finances, on the future, but particularly those people with debt are really starting to see that squeeze and are not feeling good about it. And when we think about just how many people have jobs, how many people have that extra um bargaining power when it comes to employers you'd think that things would feel a a little bit better though when we saw the q4 uh, national accounts data which tells us gdp average hourly earnings things like that what we saw was that average hourly earnings was really benign uh, and the reserve bank does their own little adjustments of that and pushed it down even further to two and a half percent year on year that is to me a sign of a dysfunctional labor market because we've got 89% of firms saying, hey, we actually can't produce as much as we want to because we don't have enough workers. We've got 444,000 vacant jobs as of November, which is the latest data. Um, We've got people um, telling the RBA, yeah, yeah, 5% over the next year is what we're going to give out in pay rises. Yet our wage growth is just incredibly, incredibly sluggish. So that could be one of the reasons we're seeing that really slow confidence. The upside is that it means rate hikes are working. It's certainly making people worried. We're not seeing much wage growth, so there's no real wage price spiral risk. And that means that, you know, given it, holding everything else equal, the Reserve Bank's not going to work quite as hard uh, and have to push the rate up quite as high as if um, we did see people keep spending, feeling confident and doing things like that. The expert team at Global X ETFs is ready to support your goals with their wide suite of ETFs. For the latest updates, follow Global X ETFs on LinkedIn and Twitter at Global X ETFs Australia. Adelaide, I do apologise for that. Um, Heath just came in. I didn't want him to start 
uh, stepping on your lines as you were. Uh, please continue. Thank you. So, look, the upside of the soft data that we're seeing, whether it's very low consumer confidence, whether it's really benign wage growth, lower building approvals, and also a real slowdown in household consumption growth, the upside of all of this is it means the Reserve Bank is seeing some effects of their rate hikes. And what that means is all else equal, they don't have to work quite as hard as in a situation where households were feeling really confident, spending a heap of money and continuing on as if the rate was 0.1. Yeah. Now, the only big caveat there is that housing prices barely moved in February. So ANZ uh, forecast a 10% decline in capital city prices through this year. Uh, but in February, it, it went down by about 0.1, 0.2%. What that's telling us is that, particularly in Sydney, you know, where it's so expensive, people can buy houses. They're not seeing their borrowing capacity go down quite enough. They've got a bit of risk appetite or a little bit of extra income to uh, allow those prices to stay flat. And that would be, I think, one of the bigger signals that, look, while there is some soft data out there, there's also some big data out there saying, actually, we can afford to do all this inflationary stuff uh, and the Reserve Bank might have to up the volume on their uh, rate hikes then. Where's your expectation? And, and Heath, mate, uh, g'day, Heath Moss from HLM Investments. Uh, I, pro- hey, I apologise apologize for that clunky introduction. Uh, <laughs> anyone who thinks I was being rude, there was actually a little bit of outage uh, on the and the. I'm going to try my absolute best to uh, to ham fist the editing on that one. We just had a bit of an outage on the microphone, but I was not uh, wasn't being directly rude to Adelaide there. But I uh, look, speak so we've got someone from Adelaide in Heath. Uh, Heath, jump in anytime you want. Um, but no Adelaide, worries. finally, uh, your expectations on rates? We do still have a peak terminal rate call of four point one percent, so a twenty five basis point next week uh, on for the March uh, meeting, yep. and then we've got two more after that. Uh, this year. So we still think 4.1. And I think one really important point is that because we've seen a lot of uh, media coverage of this from other forecasters, we're actually not expecting any rate cuts until November 2024. We think that RBA is going to have to keep... Did you say 2024? Uh, Until November 2024, we won't see any cuts. Okay. That's, yeah. Sorry, go on. That's, wow. (laughs) Yeah, and the reason is the labour market's still looking really, really good. Household financial stability in the first tranche of the fixed rate roll-off of mortgages is looking pretty good. Mm. And so there is some softness in the data, but that's supposed to happen. And when inflation is 7.8%, you know, it is going to take a while before the Reserve Bank can dial down those restrictive rates and let things get at that back to normal the last thing they want to do is do that too early and give people all this economic pain and still have inflation outperforming yeah so we think that they'll be keeping it at 4.1 for quite some time excellent well there you go if there's anything else you'd like to mention now is the time otherwise uh heath and i are going to talk about copper and then oil i think just just quickly on on house oh, prices good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just got a quick one. Uh, we've seen um, immigration net immigration last year of four hundred thousand. Uh, we'll expect it. I don't think the official figures out yet, but they're expecting four hundred thousand and three hundred and fifty thousand um, uh, this year. Do you think that will help stem the house price um, falls uh, moving forward, Adelaide, or uh, do you do you see some more more falls moving forward? As the slow. Uh, increase in supply of housing due to all of the issues in the construction sector. But I also think that housing prices have further to fall because what what I think is more powerful than immigration and, and that supply demand in housing is the effects of borrowing capacity because everyone can borrow less every time the Reserve Bank hikes rates. And at the same time, we have inflation um, really taking away a lot of that discretionary income that's used for borrowing capacity as well. So every time you pay more for your groceries, for your mortgage, for utility bills, that reduces your borrowing power. And so that is still going to be the more powerful factor this year. Although, you know, when we look at the modelling, we think people's borrowing capacity will be reduced by around a third. So to have a peak to trough housing decline of only 18%, which is what we're forecasting, that's actually telling us something that, you know, something else is happening in a positive direction. And I think immigration, uh, as you mentioned, is really key to that. Excellent. Beautiful. That, that works That works for me. Thank you very much for that. Adelaide Timbrell, Senior Economist at the ANZ. Thanks for having me. Thank Hi. you. No worries. Uh, now, Heath, how are you now? Yes, mate. 
Very good, thanks, mate. How are you? Uh, yeah, not bad. Now, not not to go into details, it's been a little bit of a disrupted week for me, so I haven't been able to be as as across some of the intricacies of things as I would have liked to have been. Uh, but copper, what's yes. what's going on with that? It seems like it's found a floor, and some of these little copper things that I like uh, seem to have, uh, seem to be shining again. What uh, WTF? <laughs> yeah, well, look, we saw saw. Uh copper trough out uh, bottom last year around November around 330 a pound um, and it's currently around 410 give or take a, a few cents um, and basically th- this year we've seen a real acceleration in, in copper just based on on that China reopen story um, we saw this week that uh, the the PMIs uh, for China came out well ahead of forecast we saw a composite uh, of over 56 uh, when i think it was expected to be around the 52 mark new orders were through the roof so it, it really looks like the reopening in china is is moving along um a lot better than uh, expected and i think even one of their finance ministers came out and s- said this it, it the, the reopen especially since the um new year has been a lot stronger than expected and then last year you had also had a lot of bond issuance coming into the construction in the property sector. I think the last figure I saw was over US two trillion in China being piled into the uh, to the um, construction and property sector over there. Mm-hmm. So we will start to finally seeing the fruits of that that labour come through probably around Q two um, in the property sector over there because we all know how much maligned it was in twenty twenty two and you know some of these larger firms were on the brink of collapse. You know, so the government has stepped in, helped uh, you know help their balance sheets out, plus giving them a boost to uh, start construction and, and, and pumping their economy again uh, this year. But I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't expect the economy to be uh, driven by construction and property as it has done in the past. I think it will be a more services-based led um, uh, bounce this time around. Um, and we've seen, we've seen uh, Chinese uh, bank accounts and deposits um, are about four to five times higher than the average. Um, at this time, uh, you know, similar the similar story to what happened here in Australia and across the globe. We were locked down for some time. We were, we weren't allowed to spend the way we normally would spend, and so our savings rates went through the roof. And uh, when we were finally allowed to reemerge, you know that that all fell into the economy, uh, dispersed into the economy. And I think the same thing's going to happen in China there. But it all connects and helps each other. So that's that's why I've seen copper bounce basically. Yeah, yeah, I, that's uh, that's good enough for me. And I think that well, we've said this on the podcast. I think it was the Christmas special we did a couple of months ago. Wow, a couple of months ago, how quickly that went. The Chinese reopening is inflationary, and then Kit did say it long term it is it is disinflationary. So that'll be interesting to see um, the way that that swings everything around. But for now, it does look like copper has found uh, a good base uh, to spring off from. I'm very bullish on the stuff as well particularly bullish oil this week. And I think that you and I had a matching a matching trade, matchy, matchy. Um, yes, yes, we did. Yeah, well, yeah, more yeah. of an investment, this one for me, at least at least uh, for a long time to come. Long Woodside, um, mm-hmm. what was your – you go through your case, which is probably a bit more – you're better with the actual specific company stuff. And I, I've, I've just got a few things that, that came up on the podcast last week as well that I've sort of been running with um, just as they've gone on. But uh, you go first. Yeah, look, I mean, my 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 theory around oil at the moment isn't as bullish as some uh, in the short term, but longer term, I am bullish. I think short term, we, we have an energy glut at the moment still because, you know, demand in the US and the EU uh, wasn't as high during winter. They had milder winters, higher temperatures, so didn't need as much energy uh, to heat homes, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, and then you had China, which was still only just re-emerging from their lockdowns, et cetera you know, was actually burning off gas and turning shipments away because they had so much in storage. Um, and that's part of the reason I think oil especially will stay lower f- for a little bit longer is because China's SPR uh, reserves are, are chockers at the moment and they will draw from them to keep prices lower in the short term rather than inflate their economy and have people having to, you know, pay higher prices on the open market for oil. Um, I think Morgan Stanley have around 110 target on oil by the end of the year. I think that's a bit too bullish. I think that will happen in Q1, Q2 next year. But uh, longer term, 
we still have underinvested in energy and oil and, and production and infrastructure. So, I, again, I agree with Morgan Stanley there. We will see a $100 barrel of oil again moving forward. So what did we do to get exposure to that? I mean, we both jumped into Woodside uh, Energy, uh, WDS. It's around, uh, I think, $37.50 at the moment. Um, it was lower when we jumped in. It sure was. But they, they, they had a, I mean, their report um, missed market forecasts, um, basically on lower oil, um, realised prices and uh, higher input costs. 23% of their um their revenue comes from the Henry Hub exposure, LNG exposure, and that took a dive towards the end of last year. So I think that dragged things down a bit. But moving forward, um, they produced around 157 million barrels of oil equivalent last year. That's increasing to 100 to 180 to 190 million barrels of oil this year, and that's on the back of having a full year of the BHP assets that they acquired around June last year. Uh, so that should help offset any any lower realised price that they're going to get this year if it happens. Um, huge yield, around a 10% yield even at these prices. I would expect that to be around the same 8 to 10 moving forward, only trading around 10 times forward earnings. Uh, mainly, obviously, LNG and gas exposure there. But again, it's all correlated. It's all linked. Asia is is in the midst of a massive gas explosion in terms of converting coal um, power stations to gas power stations, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, China is a big player there. So, um, yeah, that's my thesis behind Woodside. And, you know, I've got a, you know, at least a 12 to 24 month horizon on that. Yeah. Um, and I can see it easily going above $40 a share uh, in the near term. Yeah, it, it it does look pretty good on the charts as well, which is yep. uh, which is always nice to have that confirmed. Oh, it does it does also go ex dividend next week on the eighth for okay. two dollars eleven Australian a share. So be wary of that. The share price will probably pull back on the back of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, but yeah, all things being equal. Yeah, that's that's absolutely it. So uh, that uh, it's not so bad. Going back, sort of, uh, I've got more of a broader. You know how I sort of do the big the big picture sort of stuff that. I'm looking at, I think that what Alec said on the podcast last week, so Alec Cutler, head of the Orbis Global Balance Fund, yep. just uh, just picking it apart and I actually had to get a transcript made up and listen to it. I just went, he actually did, did call it that, well, you know, he's, he has predicted that Russia production cuts will be more long-lasting than the market has given it credit for, that stopping production in, in winter or when things are still cold is actually pretty detrimental to your, to your tools and to your rigs, they're like actually at the granular level. Yeah. Um, that it'll be very difficult for them to get these things started up again. Um, yeah, exactly. Because there's no one there to really help them, except for as as you mentioned, Schlumberger, um, the biggest uh, the biggest drillers in the world, because they're French and so they can still operate in Russia. Thanks for your help. The uh, <laughs> but that's uh, but but they're the only guys that are helping. Everyone else has had to go out. Um, so yep. and as he did mention as well, it's not like. Drilling it from the Urals was just you stick a straw in and it just popped out. Um, it's mm -hmm. not as easy as it was before and it's actually quite difficult. So it was interesting sort of going back over his his notes on that and just saying, you know what, China, yes, okay, they've got their SPRs, SPRs up. They've still got a big gap between um, what they need to get to or what they're, you know, their 3 million barrels a day and where they are now. So they still need to pick that up. Um, I think that probably they're a little bit better with their SPR than the US has been as it actually needs to be strategic, not just saying to, to keep prices low. Yeah, they have more freedom with how they use it. Yeah, they, no, that's, that's, that's true. But the um, anyway, so that gap picks up. Production does come off. The world is actually going to continue turning um, and turning very strongly. And like you said, there's no, no new production. I, I, I'm actually quite... I'm actually quite bullish oil for the for the next couple of months, um, and even if it's even if it stays flat, from a valuation point of view, the S and P five hundred oil is trading on that uh, eleven times next uh, next year earnings. The oil, uh, the sorry, the energy sector, comparing that to the entire market of eighteen times, it's got a free yep. cash flow yield, FCF yield of eleven percent compared to the market as a whole, which is four percent. That's that's free cash flow over your market cap. So that's just how much you've got just sitting. Just sitting around, ready to give back to, to shareholders. That's that's pretty phenomenal. All of these things just just scream out to me that I mean, you just got to have some allocation to it um, as well. And it was it was it was just sort of raised that for me that yep, got to add to that add to that allocation of uh, the the fuel ETF, but also some good local stuff in Woodside. Um, get those dividends coming in next week. 
Yeah, that's that's the type of thing that will hold valuations up, even if oil remains flat. Um, those you know returns to shareholders via dividends and buybacks, because you know the likes of BP, Shell, and all that, they're all swimming in cash, and mm. they've really got nothing to do with it because they've they haven't been exploring as much because of you know the pressure that has been on them for the last ten years to you know cut back because of the mm-hmm. ESG and the, the climate uh, factors. So. Yeah, they're, they're going to return that to shareholders and, and you know, we're all, we all want a piece. Yeah, and uh, look, if it's there, then take it. There is a big thing, and we'll close on this because I did say it was going to be a quickie today, um, and we had this conversation in the in our investment committee at VFS, which we have every day that we're required to do, and enjoy doing it. Uh, the It's probably more, and I, and I sort of stopped when we had the conversation because I was banging the drum about energy a while ago and just saying, look at all this cash. It's all very sloshy. Um, it's got to go somewhere. The guys, and they said, eventually when we don't need oil, and this is, you know, this is probably more of a pub conversation for, for, than an investment committee conversation. It's just like, what do they, what do they companies do? What does BP and Shell and all of these ones, what's their next step in a, in a future non-oil use world? And that was sort of that, that, this sort of big scheme. And I mentioned the fact that a lot of the companies had actually started to to switch and, and they were using that sort of, uh, I think it was BP or, or was it Shell or someone like that, uh, that a couple of weeks ago, they actually reversed their switch that they were going to be moving more into that renewable side, but the margins just weren't big enough and the, the, the less thing for it. Where do you see long-term the e- energy companies coming? I know this is sort of a big picture sort of, you know, beautiful world uh, mind thing that we're looking at here, but what's your what's your long-term end end place where do you see bp actually sitting in our lives i think um moving forward the big picture longer term 10 plus years is hydrogen i think um these guys will shift into hydrogen and find those massive hydrogen resources and you know we'll have that green hydrogen gas um uh, base load power um pr- production um globally um, but also, I think it is it BP or Shell. I can't remember. But one of them invested in an EV charging station company last week. I think it was 130 million or something. So yeah. maybe they start looking at uh, you know a, a bit of electric vehicle infrastructure as well to you know for their you know 20 year outlook or so uh, moving forward. Um, but I think hydrogen will be the big play because it's an easy transition for them. They know you know their gases. They know their energy. I think it's easy enough for them to go find a deposit and uh, start production. Yeah, and, and anyone who actually wants to know what these things are, you just go to the company strategy, and they'll tell you what their what their plans are for this time. However, how much you actually believe that is is an entirely different thing. But the look, that's all we got time for today, Heath. Like I said, quick and fast. Uh, get it out of Friday. It's almost twelve o'clock over at this time, and I've got to run. Uh, I've got to run things around all over the place today. So no Heath Moss from HLM Investments, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much and happy Friday. And to you too. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Talk to you later. See you guys. You can find us on iTunes at The Bip Show or wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Twitter at the underscore Bip underscore show and we're on Facebook too. Just search for The Bip Show. I've got a website. Just Google Whelan Capital. It's got all of the links and all of the documents that you want to know. Individually, I am at James Whelan 42 on Twitter. The show is produced by whoever I could find on the day. Thank you very much. We'll catch you next time. This episode might be over, but your ETF investing journey with Global X is only just beginning. The expert team at Global X ETFs is ready to support your goals with their wide suite of ETFs. For the latest updates, follow Global X ETFs on LinkedIn and Twitter at Global X ETFs Australia.